Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Arnold Manjoli. This is Grateful, Ready, Open, Willing, and I'm so happy that you're here with us this evening. Uh, I'm going to welcome our guests in a moment, but a few little housekeeping things first. Uh, uh, we do this to support the Actors Fund and Broadway Cares. So uh, any of you who are watching, whether you're watching live now or whether you're watching this in replay later, uh, we ask you please to contribute any amount you like to the Actors Fund and or Broadway Cares. Even five bucks times so many of you can help a great deal. And all of the artists who participate here, including our lovely esteemed guests this evening, donate their time in the hope that uh, what they're doing will contribute something that will then pay it forward uh, through your generosity if you feel so moved. Uh, small housekeeping thing, we are broadcasting on Facebook Live via StreamYard. Uh, and because of the agreement between StreamYard and Facebook Live, it means that unless you're a member of StreamYard, your name will not show up if you make a comment. So if you'd like uh, us, uh, these uh, panelists, to see who you are, type your name in at the beginning so that we know who's talking. Otherwise, it will show up as Facebook user. Uh, OK, so I think those are the housekeeping things. I am so grateful. Oh, that. Um, that helpful information that's in writing, that's my amazing Lindsay Bristol, who has been helping us with this since the beginning of the pandemic when uh, we started. There she is. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. So uh, I am so excited tonight to introduce four of my very favorite people. Uh, we were going to be a panel of five, and uh, I have not been able to reach Allie Ewald. So Allie just told me she's coming. Oh, my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> All right, so we will have our panel yes. of five. Extraordinary humans. Thank you, Pearl. You're um, welcome. And allow me to introduce in uh, uh, some, maybe I'll do it in alphabetical order by first name to see if I can mix it up. Um, Anne Harada and <laughs> Diane Phelan and Lainey Sakakora and Pearl Sun uh, are with us tonight. And the person who alphabetically would have been first is showing up shortly. So um, I'm delighted to uh, say hello and to welcome them here. Uh, I'm going to start by asking a question of all of you who are watching, and that is, uh, Lindsay, can you take me out of the frame and still enable them to hear my voice? Maybe, maybe not. All right, since maybe not, let's just pretend I'm not here. I'm not here. Uh, what do you see? Uh, my lifeline is very short. I see that. Um, <laughs> what, what do you see? Uh, some people might see for women. Some people might see for Asian people or for Asian Americans. Some people might see, um, I'm going to do that because it's prettier than my hand. Uh, I'm going, uh, some people might see uh, four young people. Uh, my mom's <laughs> 94. My mom's 94. She always says to me, what kids are you having on that thing you're doing? Um, some people might see four old people because, you know, maybe there's like my, my uh, grandniece and grandnephew who live in Japan who are uh, three and five years old. Some people might see four Broadway performers. Some people might see Broadway royalty. So I'm curious what you see. And now I'm going to turn it over to our panel to ask them about themselves and just to describe what they see when they look at this group themselves included. Who would like to, who's inspired to say something? Yeah, I would sure. like to. Um, I literally am like crying right now because I think these are some of the strongest women that I know, um, just amazing advocates for themselves and our community. Um, I, I'm just so happy to see them. I haven't seen any of them in so long and it hurts me because um, I just think they're so amazing and I'm so proud of everything they've done. You know. That's how Beautiful. I feel. I, I, I'm looking at people that I have long, long admired and just emulated and my friends and favorite coworkers and women that I look up to. Should I go next? Please do. <laughs> uh, you know, Diane and I went to college together uh, and I remember um, also the very first time that I met Anne. <laughs> Do you remember it too? Yes, so clearly. Um, we're, we're very emotional right now. These yeah, days. we are, bro. Sorry, sorry, yeah. guys. So um, please don't apologize for that. Let's I was, 
I was doing um, a college production of Little Shop of Horrors. She was wonderful. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they, um, she, along with Alan Maroka, and I think Jason was with you guys too, right? Jason Ma? I have no idea who was there. <laughs> I mean, I definitely remember, I definitely, I'm pretty sure Jason was there. Was, I think it was you and Alan and Jason were coming to see Rich Serralo. Yeah, Hi, okay. Allie. Hi. Hi, um, Hi sorry. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> so glad you're here. Hi. Um, I think you were coming to see Rich Swallow, who was playing the dentist. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I met you all after the show, and I was just so excited to meet all of you. And you were all so lovely and supportive. And um, I think, I think, had you just done, or were you going to do falsettos? We must have just done it. Or, you just done it? Yeah. You know. Yeah, because how else would we know Rich otherwise? Yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, I've just done it, but and I then do remember I seeing you and going, "This girl is great." <laughs> <laughs> it was so amazing to meet all of you, and and Rich had like warned me, he's like, "I've got a bunch of friends coming," and I was like, "Okay." <laughs> and, um, I will and say, I saw that falsettos, <laughs> and to this day, to so this good. day, it is one of the best shows I have ever seen in my life. And I am not saying that just because I'm talking to the five of you here. I'm saying that because I've said that to so many people over the years when they say, what's the best thing you've ever seen? Like you've seen 5,000 oh, shows. What's the Thank best you. thing you've ever seen? That was it. I, I just sat there. It was, it was the best production of falsettos I've seen and still to this day. Sorry, Lincoln Center. But, <laughs> but truly, I didn't understand how that didn't go directly to Broadway and just run. That's like, you know, wow. the best I could have seen. Uh, Lainey, do you want to say anything? And Ali, I'll ask you as well. We're just talking about what you see here. What, you know, take me out of it. But what you see here in the five, five of you. First, I'm so pissed at Anne Harada right now because like, is she just like made me well up like right away when she said that seeing everyone made her cry. Because first of all, I hate getting emotional and I don't know what happened after kids then now I'm an emotional person and I hate that about myself because I didn't shed a tear until I was in my 20s. So <laughs> Anne made me really mad. But to answer your, yes, to answer your question, um, I see my sisters, I see my family, I see my community. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, Anne. So is, I'm starting the hour like this, so I'm just gonna blame Anne the whole time now. Okay, good. that's, that's yeah, fine, okay. lady. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh. It's hard right now, Arnold, because it's like, I feel like it's so much is going on. Mm -hmm. It's just I'm, all my emotions are right here, and I can't, I can't seem to, just like get my wits about myself. So this actually is a little difficult. You know, I find myself having trouble articulating um, all the things that are in my head right now. So, but yeah, anyways, That's okay. Allie, Allie will be that is, that much is okay, more articulate Lainey. than me. <laughs> no, I, I just want to say, I want to say to all of you, that is totally okay. You know, nobody was invited here to be like, you know, some sort of formal speaker or some authority on anything. You're invited here for your hearts and your souls and for what you're feeling and for what you have to say. So all of that is welcome here. And please don't feel in any way uncomfortable about that. There's no need to apologize for any of it. I'm, I'm thrilled you're here. And part of the communication that I'm hoping this hour will bring is for other people to get to know your hearts a little bit, as I know for some of you, you know. So Ali, let me bring it to you. Hi everyone, I'm sorry for being late. Also, I realize I don't have my pronouns. I'm she, her as well. Um, Lainey, thank you for just making me well up. So you passed it forward. <laughs> we'll blame it all on you. It's all my fault. <laughs> um, but I'm, just, I'm just so grateful to, to see everyone. You know, I, I look at, you know, this amazing group of groundbreaking, incredible women who are super, inspiring on so many levels performance wise and as human beings and i'm i'm just grateful grateful to be in their company um oh see it's time to be um <laughs> during this time in particular but you know but always and i just kind of wish i could give everyone all the hugs all the virtual yeah. hugs are coming virtual hugs indeed yeah i uh Wow. Uh, um, so I, I uh, neglected to say at the opening what I've said to all of you, but I uh, haven't said to our audience. What we're doing here uh, in this hour is called um, a brilliant conversation. Um, that's not because, oh, it's going to be so brilliant. You'll be amazed. Um, although maybe, 
what it is, is uh, I work as a life coach as well as a casting director. And uh, in my life coaching training, one of the things we learned was an exercise called a brilliant conversation. And the point of the exercise is to define some ground rules as we talk. And it's very simple. Firstly, uh, there is no desired outcome or result in a brilliant conversation. That is not uh, what we're here to do. We are here to listen to one another, to just, and that goes for those of you who are in attendance, as well as uh, all of us here on the panel, just to listen very carefully to one another and to really hear one another and to allow whatever is being said to influence what we will then say if we respond or add into the conversation at that point. Uh, we do not need to come to any conclusion. A successful, brilliant conversation is uh, determined by if we later find ourselves thinking about it, perhaps later this evening, perhaps tomorrow or three days from now, a question, a thought, a perspective, a new idea that's forming continues to play out in our mind, uh, that we're wondering about things, that we're, we're uh, engaged in a way that we were not before we spent this time together. So I ask everyone to really listen. Maybe it's not a time for multitasking. Maybe it's a time to just hear what these women have to say. Uh, so uh, that said, uh, there's a quote by the writer uh, Maxine Hong Kingston, in a time of destruction, create something. So uh, we're starting with just creating this conversation, this dialogue. Uh, perhaps it will bring some understanding within our community. And... Uh, I'd like to take this uh, first uh, bit that we were talking about and ask you to dig a little deeper and share, if you would, what defines you as an artist, as a woman, as an Asian American, as I, I don't use this term lightly when I refer to you as Broadway royalty, but uh, for anyone who does not know, uh, <clears throat> the careers of these women have all gotten them to Broadway in some incredible and historic ways. Um, and uh, I, I don't need to go into the specifics of, of everyone, but I guess during the shutdown, uh, I would uh, categorize this group of people as those who were dramatically affected and quite suddenly. Um, uh, Ali made history recently as the first Asian American woman to play Christine in Fan of the sorry, to play Christine in Broadway's Phantom of the Opera, because as you well know, uh, I had cast the first Asian uh, Christine in Phantom of the Opera in the, well, I guess not if you count the, the Asia productions, but uh, in North America, in the Toronto production, uh, Margaret Ann Gates, who may be on here tonight, uh, was uh, the first Christine in a production where we also had Scott Watanabe as our Pianji, uh, and Harriet Chung was in the Corps de Ballet. So, um, uh, these kinds of events are some of what these women are doing every day. So I would like to know a little more from your perspective. How do you define yourself? Please, I'll Lena, go. just jump in. Yeah. Um, I would have to say from the beginning of my career through now, um, what defines me the most is my integrity. So uh, whether I like it or not, um, it's pretty uncompromising. So from the first moment, um, if we're talking about uh, racism and uh, the lack of inclusion and diversity in our industry and uh, the things that we've had to face, uh, I would say from the moment I got my equity card, I did my first Asian specific show where I was 21 and I had to stand up right before a dress rehearsal when the PSM announced, everyone who's not Asian, tape your eyes. And it was a um, co-production between Tuts and Fifth Avenue Theater. And I'll just say it because we have to start talking about this. Um, and I said, I stood up and I said, I said to every person in my dressing room, I said, if anyone tapes your eyes, I will kill you. And I got up and I went to stage management. I said, if anyone tapes their eyes, I will get on the next plane and I'm going home. There's never been a show that I didn't have to speak up, whether as a performer, as a choreographer, um, in any situation. And I'm willing to always make the biggest sac personal sacrifice. So you might not hear my voice a lot publicly. I don't do a lot of <clears throat> talks or these kinds of things, but in the trenches, 
I will be the one who will step forward and, and, and say it's wrong. And I will sacrifice my own career for it. And I've always done it. Lainey, I have to say, I did, when you first said that, it took me a moment to even understand what you meant. Like I thought, tape your eyes, like put duct tape over your, like I didn't even understand that, but you're talking about something that's the equivalent of blackface, really. It's yellow face. And actually as a choreographer, um, most recently I worked at, um, the last time I had to, well, I would have to say as a choreographer, I also had to do the same thing. I had to have a full uh, conversation with Harbor Lights, the only equity theater over on Staten Island, and um, it's defunct now, but the same thing. We're in the auditions, we're in an equity principal call um, auditions. A guy comes in, I'm talking to the producing artistic director. She says, I like him best. I said, well, you can't hire him. He's not Asian. You wanted him for Lunta. And she says, we could just put brown makeup on his face. And I said, no, you can't. That's called yellow face. Um, I ultimately uh, left, quit that job, but not until after I had multiple arguments insisting that yellow face was absolutely wrong. I, I have every, in every single moment that I've done this, I haven't worked again for those same people, but it's always created some sort of change. So if I'm gonna say what has defined me as an artist, it's always that, it's my integrity. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you for that. I've watched it. <laughs> I've watched Lainey do this. I've been in rooms with Lainey when she's done this and uh, uh, I learned a lot by her example. Thank you, Diane. Anybody That's else? really only happened to me once where, and it was nowhere near like a production as big as anything you've done. Um, but I, I did have to say it was like in an off-Broadway venue and it was a review and the scene was like, you know, a Chinese restaurant at Christmas kind of a thing. And, you know, I was going to play, you know, I guess a waitress in the restaurant and somebody else in the cast, and it was all white people besides me, somebody else in the cast was going to play a Chinese waiter. And so I was like, okay. And they turned up with like a coolie hat and a little hoppy coat and a pigtail. And I was like, "You oh, stop. I was like, it's not, you know, it's not the gold rush. This is a person in a Chinese restaurant now. He, he does not have to wear any of those things to indicate waiter in a Chinese restaurant. It's like, no. I was like, no, it's fine. He can wear the coat. He doesn't have to do anything else to himself. You know, this is insane. Um, and I was like, I was like, and if this doesn't change, I'm walking. So bye. You know, like what, what can I do? It's like, I can't watch that. I can't be part of that. And I think that that's, you know, and they were completely, once I explained it, they were like, oh my God, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, and they completely, you know, did it, but you just have to say it. And nobody had ever said it to them before, I guess, is what it was. And if there's nobody there, that's why it's so important to have representation on all the parts, like not just in the show, but behind the table and, you know, everywhere. Because if nobody tells them, they're gonna go like, that's fine. It indicates Chinese person, you know, like crazy. Um, and that wasn't even that long ago, you know, so. Wow. What can we say, kids? Um, not, not if I'm behind the table, they're not doing that. <laughs> It's a long, it's a long haul is what I'm saying. You know, we, we've been here a long time um, and hopefully we'll continue to work for, no, for some more long time, but it's hard to, you know, it's hard to say. We, none of us know what's going to happen. And, but it's, I feel, I do feel, I have felt that change has been occurring, that there's been more opportunities for us, obviously. You know, but still not to the level that I think we need and deserve. Um, and I'm very, correct me if I'm wrong, Lainey, but do you remember like in the 80s when um, you'd see a chorus, you'd see like an ensemble and there'd be like maybe one Asian girl and one Asian guy in the ensemble? Uh, I think you'd lucky if you get one of right. each. Right, if you get one of each. Sometimes it would just be one, you know, but that's even more than I see now. Yeah. Do you know what is. I mean? And I was like, what happened? I feel like we went backward. 
it's because it comes in waves. And that's why th this is my concern with the term better, because we've, we've been around long enough, decades now, right. that we've seen the surge go up. So we all thought it got better in the early right. 90s, right? Mm -hmm. We thought when um, we, you know, with like Carousel, right? And like Cinderella, right. and we thought we were right. heading in this certain direction, right? But then we're like back and then we're watching shows like what? Was it Catch Me If You Can or something? Like I'm still, then that era of all white cast again came showing up again. So, you know, I don't know. I honestly don't know if this is getting better because I've seen this happen before. We, we get a surge, we're trendy, you know, until we're, and that's the problem. You know, the gatekeepers, there's always these white gatekeepers that decide whether or not, you know, it's valid to have us on stage. So until that changes, I don't really see how we don't, it, it's always reactive like the Rockettes, like it's reactive to diversify when there's criticism. There's criticism right now. So yeah, we're gonna see it, or there's success with money, with Hamilton. So that's why it's always reactive until they, there's an actual thought process of believing truly that this is what we see, like walking down the street in Times Square is what we need to see the diversity is same on stage, you know, it can't, yes. then how, how is anything really going to change? How is it really going to change in a way that stays with us, you know, and really gets better? So I'm really confused about the term better. Whew, Lainey, this is the first time I've ever been in a space with you and I'm so <laughs> grateful. I'm so, like, you are speaking my language. Um, I, I mean, honestly, I say that the fact that we exist speaks volumes, right? The fact that we are still in this industry, the fact that we are still pushing forward, the fact that we, I think all of us in our own ways have um, have challenged certain systems of, you know, what we are and aren't allowed to play. Um, and I think, and I know for a fact, I'm sure all of you can attest to this, when you go to the stage door at the end of shows, um, what hits me the most is when I see Asian people, I'm gonna get emotional, but when I see Asian people at the stage door who say, wow, I've never seen um, an Asian person on Broadway before. I'm just, you know, it must be so hard. It, you know, it must be, um, there's so few of us there um, here and I'm just so grateful and keep going. You know, that's what they say to me. Don't don't give up. Just keep keep going, and and that it means so much. It means so much to hear from people that it. I know that it mattered to me. You know, I I came to New York on a high school trip, and I saw Miss Saigon, and I thought, oh my God, there are people who look like me on stage. What is that? What does that even mean? That oh, I can do this. I can do this. I'm a I'm able to do this. I'm allowed to do this. Um, and, and, you know, in the same way that Barack Obama was president. And so young children are like, I can be president. If I'm a black person, I can be president. But before he arrived and same with Kamala Harris, before they arrive and before they are present, you, you, you have to, I mean, it's very hard. And some of us do have to pave the way if there isn't that representation in front of us, but it's a lot easier if there is, <laughs> it's a lot easier to not have to create the whole en entire image for yourself and then push it up, right? Um, but yeah, I, integrity is big for me too, Lainey. I think that you have to be proud of what you work on and what you do. And um, I care very deeply for um, all marginalized communities. And I think there is so much work to be done. Um, and I speak out as much as I possibly can. And um, and I also listen, I also listen. And I try to see where people's motivations are, right? Where do these uh, preconceived notions arise? Um, I recently worked with a creative team that said, you know, originally I, when we created the show, we had an image in our minds that the lead, these certain leads could only be played by Caucasian people. But it wasn't until, you know, a, a few of us had stepped into the roles who were people of color and um, 
this person admitted, he, he said, you know, I, you have all changed my mind because I didn't see it, but I needed to see it first. So I think we need to be the change as much as we're pushing for change. We need to be the change too. So. I love that. Thank you. Uh, I, I, um, I, I still want to hear from the rest of you on that, but uh, just to add this into the conversation, because it's sort of coming up now is, do you find that you are generally, I mean, I, I know most of your backgrounds and career histories, but do you find in your own experience of your career that you are mostly called in and cast for things that are, this is the role of an Asian American, so you're brought in? Or do you find there are more places where you're brought in for a role that is not specific, racially specific in any way? And what's your experience of that and how is it different? So let's continue talking, but just add that in if you want to filter it into your, um, you know, what defines you that we're talking about. Um, I'd like to sort of sort of play, play off of both those things. I mean, I think, you know, um, obviously I am mixed race. So my mom is Filipino, my dad is white, um, which sort of allows me into a lot of rooms, I think that, um, that I might not necessarily be into. I've joked that, um, you know, playing roles like Christine on Broadway, that maybe in some ways I can work as a gateway um, person of color so that I can sort of, you know, get a foot in the door so that hopefully, you know, people that are of darker skin or more obvious Asian features or, or whatever um, can, you know, can continue because as Pearl was saying, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, people don't have great imaginations, particularly, you know, our gatekeepers that, that we are struggling with. And that is, you know, again, as, as Anne and Lainey were saying, sort of the importance of representation in the room so that people, um, so that we can hold them accountable and tell them, you know, how, um, how things really are. Um, when I think about, you know, sort of what defines me, um, I think in terms of, you know, particularly this group, like that we are, that we're all part of this chain of performers, our history and the future ahead of us. Um, I think one of the amazing things about being part of the Asian American um, theatrical community is that I think that most of us are very, very aware of these things, right? Like that I was very aware that Margaret Ann Gates had played Christine in Toronto in a way that maybe not everybody is still, which is unfortunate, or that Caitlin Finney is currently um, playing or was playing Christine with the Christine alternate on the international tour, right? Like, um, and I'd worked with Caitlin when I had done um, The King and I when she was right out of school and sort of how, how we all kind of fit. Um, and sometimes exactly as, you know, as um, Lainey was saying, like, it's hard. It's not always a straight line. It's not always a beautiful trajectory and there are these like unfortunate ebbs and flows but for those of us who are fortunate to be part of that chain um that we know that in general we're just going to keep pushing pushing it forward i mean obviously as as pearl was saying you know i have the reasons why i'm in this business and a lot of that was seeing Leia Salonga play eponine in Les Mis. that was um watching uh dd magno hall and oh my gosh why are we all just crying on this <laughs> <laughs> I came all of you. Um, Judy Magno Hall and Jenny Kwan on television when I was a kid, who I then got to understudy when I was um, did my first job out of school, which was um, the Aladdin show in California. And they were like, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and they were just these incredible role models, these incredible Filipino American women who were kind to me, who helped me pin curl my hair, who walked me through my pudding for Jasmine. And so like, I can't make it through a sentence today. Um, but I think that that is part of, you know, part of the whole thing. And right now, for those of you who aren't aware out in the world, you know, there's been this very public casting notice that Tara Rubin has just put out for future replacements for Christine in Phantom of the Opera. And because of the way that, you know, that we are um, learning from this very challenging time, the way that the casting notice is listed actually speaks to all of the various um, racial backgrounds and um, and identities and ethnicities um, in a way that before it said all ethnicities. And so I've been watching, you know, people online get excited in a way that maybe they weren't before about the future opportunities um, to play Christine and have put out, you know, 
um, have been helping people who want assistance, um, particularly um, BIPOC folks to, you know, to get some tips about auditioning for Christine, because I think that that is, again, sort of part of what, what defines me in this business is, you know, kind of being the bridge of before, you know, all the amazing people that have broken down barriers before me um, to help help people in the future. I don't know if that answered any of those questions. <laughs> I don't know that it's so much a question as just, again, sharing your hearts, which is so helpful. Diane, do you want to pick up on any of that? The thing that got, that I was thinking about was that who was on my wall <laughs> and Didi was on my wall. Like I had, um, I had pictures of different actresses that it was like Roxanne Tago was up there, definitely Leia. And, you know, when that's also Broadway royalty to me, you know, like to, for you to even say the words, like to me, for me to be included in the, in the term Broadway royalty. And I see like Anne and Lainey up in here. I'm just like, okay, that is, that is amazing. And I don't, I don't feel worthy, but you know, that's great. Um, and also nonlinear, uh, just a ball of emotions as well. Um, I've been talking about lately about the importance of listening to Asian women. And so you granting that wish and having these women here, I think there's a reason why we're all so emotional, um, aside from everything that's been happening in the news, but the need to uh, amplify Asian women's voices right now is, uh, I, it's just, it's, it's an emotional thing to have us all in a room together and, and listening to everyone's stories. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to be witnessing and watching. Don't have too much more to say. I, I, I just want to listen. I just want to be in this room and soak it up. Um, yeah, passing the mic on. Thank you. Lindsay, yeah, I was going to say, let's put up some questions. I see people are asking things. Uh, do you feel included in the BIPOC movement or do you feel there needs to be something similar that is more Asian focused? That actually is one of the questions I had coming into tonight because um, I remember reading when the BIPOC movement started after the George Floyd murder uh, that because I thought BIPOC, this is a new term, which it was. And uh, I remember reading that it was very specifically because this movement would be about people of color, but that black and indigenous people for the uh, injustices they've suffered are being, uh, I'm paraphrasing this and please forgive me if I'm getting it slightly wrong, but the gist of it was that it would be black and indigenous and other people of color. And my first thought was, was that a collaborative decision. And I'm curious your perspective as Asian American women who really not only just work in the theater, but, but really have achieved some really incredible things in this industry, an industry that's very difficult to achieve anything in. Um, what is your thought on that? What is your, I mean, is there anything that perhaps there was collaboration of which I'm not aware, or is there anything you would like to, uh, offer or include about that or perspective on that. I, I am guessing that, uh, look, let's not say the George Floyd murder, but but many, many decades of, of oppression and systematic racism. I understand it, uh, uh, you know, the reason for the term BIPOC and what it comes from. But I'm curious now that we've seen that horrible murder in Atlanta, which seems to have brought this uh, issue a little more to the forefront of uh, Americans' consciousness, is there anything you'd like to offer or say or uh, suggest in terms of that or how that reads to you or how you feel about it or what could be done to make it perhaps more inclusive or perhaps again, from my perspective, perhaps it is plenty inclusive enough. I'm just curious if there's anything you, you any thoughts you have about that? Uh, to speak to Damon's question, I, I think it's both. So I think that we are included and I think we should be. And I think that we, as marginalized groups, you know, in whatever hierarchy you want to place us, we all need to be in support of each other because as Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere, right? So we all have to band together and work together for change because if we leave anyone behind, it, it will come back. 
and, and feast, right? Um, but I do think that there is an importance in having conversations like this and in having a more focused discussion about um, the AAPI community because we, we although we all have our own um, history of oppression, um, every, every group has a very individualized um, experience and we need to honor that. Um, and, you know, the mishandling of Asian peoples in this country is not uh, exclusive to this year. It's not exclusive to the recent weeks. It's been centuries long as well. Um, so there is an issue of history and not understanding and learning the history of Asian Americans in this country. And that needs to be included in our school rooms. Um, and that needs to be something that, you know, we as adults seek out for ourselves because it's not, it wasn't there. It wasn't provided to me when I was growing up. Um, at most, I had to read Farewell to Manzanar in junior high school, and that's the only reason why I knew about the Japanese internment camps. I would not have known about it until college, where I actively chose and sought out an Asian American history class. And that is when I first learned about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So, you know, and only recently in watching this documentary series, Asian Americans on PBS, did I ever see, and I knew mentally, I knew um, that it existed, but it was the very first time I ever saw a photograph of an Asian man hung and lynched. And that absolutely happened. Um, in fact, it, the history speaks that it, the greatest number of people's lynched at one time was 20 Asian men um, hundreds of years ago. So we all need to learn our history in order to un really understand the full scope of what's going on. Um, and I think that's where we start. Um, and our, our experience as Asians in the theater world is different than any other group. You know, and I, I know it's, I think it's shifted up a, a slight bit to maybe 6%, but I remember for the longest time it stood at only 2% of, act, um, of equity actors were working on, on equity contracts. I think now at this point it's about 6%. So and Pearl, think, wait, let me just uh, ask you, when you say, uh, can you get a, uh, go a little more, a little further or, or get a little more specific about when you say our experience in this industry is different from other groups? Can you talk a little more about that? Um, I just, I, I'm thinking sheer numbers of how many of us get to work. Okay. Um, our, our numbers are one of the lowest. And so, um, again, I, I think that it's about opportunity. It's about uh, really opening up the ability for us to play different kinds of roles than what is relegated to, than what we are often relegated to. And, um, and that's why I work with my agent and have for, for years and years and years in saying, you know, I'm actually interested in that role, the one that is not specifically for, for someone who looks like me, because that role speaks to me, my soul. <laughs> Anne had talked about this. We had had a previous conversation and Anne had said, please cast us for our souls and not our faces. I'm quoting Anne to herself, but, um, but it, I thought that that was a perfect description of, of what, what we're fighting for here, you know? Yeah, I would, I mean, I, oh, sorry. No, sorry, no, no, it's so hard because, I remember, I feel like when the Black Lives Matter thing happened, it was as if there were only two groups, whites and blacks. And it was like, well, obviously that's not true. You know, there's like a whole bunch of people of color, but like almost completely left out of the conversation. And and that there was no acknowledgement that like, we're here too, guys. We're in this too, you know, like fighting together. It was very like weird because you don't want to take away you know, from the group that is suffering at all. You don't want to minimize their pain by going like, I'm hurting too. But there's also like, but, to, but an acknowledgement of like, we exist and we feel this pain as well. Maybe not in the same way, but still it's there. You know what I mean? And I don't know that 
the vast majority of people really ever thought about Asian people and their problems. Tina, am I making any sense here? Like that, yes. that it was, it was all about, you know, these two big groups in America, which God knows it's a nightmare, but I'm just, but I'm, for us, it's like now people, I think are finally sort of picking up the clue phone and going like, Oh yes, there's also these people and systemically they have been oppressed and you know, they have been treated very badly by certain, you know, whatever it is that racism is pervasive. It's, you know, God knows there's been racism between Asian groups, you know what I mean? And with around everything, we're, it's like, we're all human. And I'm, you know, it's not like, you know, the Asians are so perfect and we never, you know, this is, we've never felt or acted racist towards other people, but it's sort of like, there's a whole nother group and we need to be heard. That's really, I think the part. I think, I think part of it is exactly what you're saying, Anne, and what you were saying too, Pearl, is that part of the challenge has been for people of Asian descent to be accepted as Americans. And I think that that's part of what makes our theatrical journey different in that more often than not, if we are cast as Asian people, we are cast as people from the continent of Asia as opposed to Asian Americans. Um, and it's the same as you were saying, and like we, we often get left out of conversations because unfortunately in this country, it is very hard for us to be acknowledged as part of the American fabric, even though Asian people have been here for, for hundreds of years. I think that that's a major challenge. Yeah, I feel yeah. to drop into this conversation that Ameri that Asians, the history of Asians in America have been around since before America was America. The first Asians landed in America in the 1500s in New Orleans and they were Filipinos. And they, you know, we have gradually come in, a lot of our ancestors have been here. We've been a part of the fabric of America for as long as, as there's been an America. So the fact that we've been othered and erased all this time, um, history has erased us, there's been erasures in school. I just called out my own high school because I learned about the Japanese internment through reading Snow Falling on Cedars. I was livid. So um, yeah, I think that's an important thing to say that, you know, the system known as white supremacy targets all people of color differently. You know, we, we, we talk about the model minority myth a lot um about how that is a, a wedge our community has been has been has been put onto our community so that it separates us from the black community from the native american community from the latin latin community and we've all been treated differently by the system known as white supremacy so that we are all looking at each other's like oh well well, well what about me what about me you know what about what, what are the things i've been through and every every community has suffered differently at the hands of it but this is as Carl has said earlier it's important for us to recognize that we are all stronger together and that our support of each and um, tying that back to the term BIPOC, you know, I think the only thing problematic is that it ranks things. While I do, while I think it's incredibly important to um, acknowledge and honor the suffering that the black community and the Native Amer American community has gone through, um, you know, for a long time, people were saying, are Asians even people of color? Thank God that's like not the conversation. I'm, I'm hoping that conversation's changing, but um, it's only very, very recently. And there's still, I'm sure, because social media is what it is, that there's still people who actually don't view Asians as people of color. There's a whole model minority myth coming in. And, and, and but the model minority myth happened in the late, in, in the 70s. So that before, they're not even taking into account that before that, the history of Asians here, and it just it just goes around. It goes around and around the circle. Like <laughs> there's so many things we keep hitting on, and it's like, well, and then that, and then that, and then that. Yeah, I, um, L L Lainey, I've heard the term Japanese internment camp three times in the past ten minutes, and I'm I'm wondering if you would like to share anything. Well, it's interesting because you know, the term internment camps is to make it more easier on everybody else. Truthfully, there's no one in my family that has ever called it an internment camp. 
I use the term to make it easier on you. Um, my family has always called it concentration camp. And if you look at the definition of what concentration camp is, you'll understand that these were concentration camps. The thing is, you know, comparing our sufferings, I think is what is problematic because what happens is, and we say, oh, well, you can't call them concentration camps because the Japanese Americans didn't suffer the same way, you know, uh, Jewish people did and the Nazis and the way they, they were, you know, those were concentration camps. These are not concentration camps. It's this c comparison of suffering. And I think that that's, that's very problematic and it, it makes us fight against each other, you know? So, yeah, so my father, my family, you know, they were all in a rower uh, uh, in Arkansas for three years, you know. Um, I've been having more conversations with my family. Most of my family have passed away. I have one left that was in the, um, at rower as well, and he has dementia, but I've been talking to some of my family, but you, you would be really surprised. You know, um, my aunt was talking about her father and how he was snatched off the street by the FBI because he was a professor of oceanography. So they were sure that he was poisoning the oceans. You know, um, you think about her uncle and he served for the 442nd and how he passed away and then how that news had to be delivered to his parents while they were in the camps, you know. Um, I will say one thing, though, to circle back to the idea of BIPOC, I absolutely was in support of it because Diane said something once to me that I thought was so important when I was feeling um, very broken. Like, I felt like I couldn't help right at that moment to speak up. Um, she's like, it's okay. I have you. I got you. We work in waves. So I, what I want to say is that, you know, we, we work in waves. And I think of that, about that all the time, Diane, because I think that that's important to know. So with Black Lives Matter, they I needed know. all of us. They needed us. So that's why we were being attacked a year ago. There were hate crimes against us a year ago, but we didn't talk about it, not because we didn't think it was important, but I know personally, I had fear wearing a mask, being Asian. Um, these crimes were happening, but I feel like we put ourselves aside, we tried to, so that we can put them forward. And it was important, it was a good and loving choice. I think we're speaking up now because we feel like we have the space to do so and we need to, you know, but it, but we've also been criticized saying we've never spoken up before, you know, and, and we just can't seem to get a break. We also kind of fall into a little bit of this problem where we keep circling around of always wanting to be liked and not to be offending anyone so that we hurt our the people who are our allies. Like, be careful, don't offend our allies because we want to keep them on our side. And I will say, the, the I think the seed of it is the fact that we can't, no one will stop looking at this face as foreign. So we can't be included in the conversation or be accepted or even our hurts and our sufferings or our wants or our needs or our history is so unimportant in this country because it doesn't matter how many generations we've been here. If you always look at us as not being part of America, that this is just some foreign person, then I feel like, again, that's until we fix that, until you look at me like I'm American, then I, I, I'm never going to be part of the conversation, not really. Well, now you did it. You got me crying too. <laughs> uh, I uh, we only have about ten minutes left, though. I, honest to God, I could listen to the five of you all night, really uh, joyfully. Uh, gratitude, readiness, openness, willingness. Those are four things we celebrate here and try to remember and think about in terms of our lives in show business and our lives working in the theater community and on Broadway, and also uh, in our lives as people. So I'm just curious with all that's going on in the world and with all that's brought up uh, and that you all have going on for yourselves, does any one of those attributes in particular resonate for you right now? And which one and how uh, i'm not looking for any 
Pollyanna response or any response, honestly. I'm just wondering if for you, any of those things are particularly uh, something that you feel you can draw upon in particular at the moment, or maybe not. Yeah, I, you don't, oh, go ahead, Diane, go ahead. I was just gonna say um, gratitude. Gratitude is medicine for me. Um, I went through a really rough patch a couple years ago. I had Lyme disease, it was rough. My medicine was literally gratitude. When the world is dark, it is the thing that gets me out of bed. The things, count like count them on my hand. These beautiful women here, um, this time with you, amazing conversations. My cat, tacos I'm gonna eat later. Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude is the thing that keeps my heart human. Thank you. And for me, I wanna tackle um, open, I see, I, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, Josette. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really getting to a place where, you know, if, if I, I think Diane knows this story. I know Diane knows the story, but five years ago, I, um, you know, I, I was doing back-to-back -back readings. And usually, you know, we've all done a, a ton of readings and they're usually, you know, there's breath between them. But for whatever reason, these two were sandwiched right back to back. And I got to see these audiences very much in bright light in a studio. Um, the gatekeepers, as Lainey calls them, um, the people who give the green light, right? And I just thought, oh, I've been doing this for so long. And, and why is it, has it taken this moment for me to really sit here and say, okay, there's one of me here because there's none of me over there. There's only one of me here because there are none of me on the, the other side of the table. And, um, and uh, also, that's also why we just keep hearing and seeing the similar narratives being produced over and over and over again without room and space for our voices, uh, voices of people of color, um, which I actually think is very interesting to, to watch personally um, and compelling stories. Um, so I'm open to opportunities. I, I, I just co-wrote a song with a, f a dear friend of mine. Um, and, uh, and that was very new for me. And um, I'm starting to go into producing. So, so I, you know, as much as I, I still will always, I think I will always be a performer and I will pick and choose my moments when I do that. But I need to be the change. <laughs> because I'm not gonna wait around for somebody else to do it for us. So um, I've, I've already got a couple of projects in the works and uh, Diane and I are working on something um, that'll be talked about later, but you know, so that's in the works for me as well. Yeah, thank you. Nobody better, nobody uh, better. That's been, the best news I've heard all day. I've been <laughs> glancing at all of these comments and I just wanna say how thankful and grateful I'll use the word grateful as well that all of you are here with us and you know being so supportive in the chat. It, it really means a lot. Thank you so much. Agreed. Um, I, I'll throw in um, some readiness. I mean, as we're talking about, you know, answering Josette's question about about writers. You know, we've got an amazing writer producer on here as well with Lainey. I saw this incredible reading of, you know, Hotel at the Corner, Bitter and Sweet. That was so, so wonderful. You know, a lot of us have gotten to work with um, the incredible Jason Ma and Christine Choi Johnson and Timothy Huang and Jihei Park. And, you know, the, the list kind of goes on and on. There are incredible, incredible- and Helen too. And Hel Helen, yeah. Helen. So, I mean, really like it's, it's, a, it's a depth of um, of incredibly talented Asian American um, writers, and I think it's you know we're we're all ready for those for those stories to be told, and it's amazing that you know that people like Pearl are stepping up to really get those to the forefront. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of obstacles as anybody who's ever tried to write a show and get it produced, particularly in a giant commercial um, venue, understands. But like the, the work is there. And the Everybody, watch it or sing it or do all of those amazing things. And I was going to say, unlike 
Well, most most of you, I've I'm very rarely cast in, in an Asian show. Um, for whatever reason, certainly when I was you know coming up in the industry, nobody wanted to see me in King and I. Nobody wanted to see me in Miss Saigon. You know, no no surprise really. But <laughs> there was but there was very little traditional Asian shows that I. I would made. cast you as the king. I'll just put that out well, there. Well, and you know. <laughs> When you see my boobs out, it's going to be amazing. Um, but I just feel like, so I've had a lot of opportunities that were not, for roles that were not specifically Asian. And I'm so grateful for those opportunities. And I keep, for now, for whatever reason, I, I keep getting cast that way, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, but I realize kind of not the common experience for most of us. And and maybe part of it is that just that like whatever I am, I don't fit like the Asian idea of whatever they want to see on stage. Cause you know, just don't. But for whatever reason, I'm grateful to have the jobs that I've had. Um, I would like, I want to say that I'm open. I want so much to be a part of Asian storytelling. <laughs> and I don't know how to do that necessarily. But if any of these projects that are about Asian families and Asian history come to pass, I'm here. You know, I, I think a lot of people have thought, thank you, Anthony. I think a lot <laughs> of people have thought <laughs> that, I was just too weird or like not Asian enough or maybe too American. Um, I mean, I know that I've been, like people have said like, oh, she can't be in chess or Miss Saigon or whatever, because who's gonna believe her? That's like, well, I don't know, but I'd like to have the chance to try. I'm with you on that, Anne. I'm right <laughs> there with you. Yeah, I, I felt like I couldn't get arrested in anything that was specifically Asian. Yeah. It's I very know. strange. It's so weird. It's like, oh, I'm not Asian enough. That's awesome because I'm not anything else either. <laughs> I love that. And I just, I, I, I'm sorry, we may go just a few minutes over if you're okay with that. I, um, but, and I just have to make mention of, I saw your posts about that person who wrote to you about Christmas Eve and called your depiction oh, yes. character racist and your response, which I thought was just genius and brilliant and so, uh, such an awakening uh, perspective. Do you want to say anything about that? I know we're getting toward oh, the end I here. Know. I, yeah, just, I, know. I don't I know. It's a big know. topic I mean, to bring up at the last. It's moment. a big topic to bring up. You know, the thing is that uh, you you can you don't have to like Avenue Q, and you don't have to like Christmas Eve, and you don't have to like the way I played at all. I totally get it. I feel like that character is very triggering for a lot of young people, especially because they respond so dramatically to the accent that they feel like just having the accent is such a attack on them or, or that it's a stereotype that they don't want to, uh, they associate with painfulness. Whereas my point of view has always been people have accents and you can't just erase that for the sake of political correctness. Do you know what I mean? And the whole point of MNQ is that it beats political correctness over the head, that it's a satire of Sesame Street, right? That Sesame Street is a model of like how to behave in the world and be good to your fellow man and treat everybody equally is like, you know, the gold standard. But if it's a satire of something and you're playing with like dirty puppets, then you have to kind of take that show for what it is. It wasn't meant to be, this is the way you should behave. This is what you should say. You know what I mean? I don't know. You know what I mean? So and Christmas sort of like, Eve is the smartest person on right. in Christmas the Christmas Eve is the smartest person. She's the most educated, blah, blah, blah. How many blah. languages do you speak? Right? That's right, right. there. So it's hard. It was hard for me because I now I know that a lot of people have a problem with the show and her and whatever. But I always felt like I just have to do it. I just have to play her as honestly as I can and that and find the truth and what you know she is and i don't think that there's anything wrong with necessarily an accent just on the surface because we people have accents you can't just erase a whole group of people because you don't like it 
You know what I mean? So, and so what was mad, what made me mad about this particular guy was that he was speaking on the, like that on some of his Asian friends had said to him, this offends me. So for him, he took the point of like, it's offensive and you did this and you were bad and this is wrong. And it's like, hold the phone, buddy. Why don't you think about it from my perspective or at least, you know, try to judge the show on its own merits, whatever, instead of like trying to be the voice of, I know all about racism. Do you know what I mean? That was really bugging me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and you, and you answer, your answer was really beautiful. So that's uh, what that was about. That's thank all. Thank you for addressing that. Laney, grateful, ready, open or willing. Oh, you're not going to like my answer. <laughs> Are you going to go to that bitter, overworked, tired? No, like no, no, no. I will, I will say, um, I, you're, I don't know if you're going to believe this either, <laughs> but I have to say I'm kind of this eternal optimist, right? We kind of have to be that. because um, otherwise we would, none of us would be here. If we played the odds, none yeah. of us would be here. You know, Paul mentioned like we really are like the one minority that hasn't gone up in you know numbers on Broadway. We're we are one of the lowest, and we always have been. Like you know, Anne said like we used to see one or two, and now we see none. So, so, um, but but with that, I will say, I will tell you that my I feel that I need to have a little less gratitude because I have always been so grateful to be anywhere, anywhere in the theater, to be hired in any capacity, to be grateful to take anything, right? Yeah, I have a big mouth, but I'm still just so darn grateful that you think that I can do anything. And then the humble, yeah, I'm so damn humble. But you know what? I'm been alive for long enough to know now that enough's enough. So I'm a little less grateful today because I think I deserve more. I think all of my brothers and sisters deserve more. I think that we've all have almost a little too much class <laughs> as far as <laughs> what we endure and how we keep it in and how we're so strong and thank you so much. And we're so polite and that's great. And that's why we're so damn classy and you want to invite us over for dinner. And we always bring a gift when we go to your house. But, you know, I think I'm going to tell you that I'm a little less grateful, not in a bad way, but more in like a little feisty way. Like I'm ready to, yeah, like Pearl, I, you know, it's, we need to be part of the change and it's, and it's, it's, it's getting into now levels that we're just not seeing at all. There is just there, we need to, we need to rise up. It's, we have to be there producing. We have to be there directing. We have to be there casting. You know, we have to be there working in other levels now. So, yeah, I will just say, I'm sorry, Arnold, but I'm a little less grateful. You don't have to be sorry. And you, <laughs> you, have, you have been to my house and you've always brought a gift. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, I would like to ask your permission because I know we're at an hour here. Um, are you guys OK if I ask one last question or does anybody have to get off because you're on a time constraint? Um, Thank Before you, you ask so that much. one question, Arnold, I just want to say to a, a couple of uh, people in the chat who are young AAPI uh, performers or about to go to school, uh, we are here for you. Go for it. Go for it and put your entire selves into everything that you do. I'm smiling, Pearl, because you just answered my question. My, my, my question was, I got this email from a former NYU student uh, of mine who uh, uh, actually may be the person who asked that. And I just want to read you one or two sentences from it and ask your response. She said um, uh, in her email, because she heard about this talk and she was so excited and, and maybe her. Uh, she said, I have been struggling these past few weeks to stay present and artistically motivated given the attacks on our Asian community. And I'm so grateful that you are creating the space to highlight some incredible Asian performers and their experiences. I'm very much looking forward to the event. And my question was, what, if anything, would you say to her? Well, let me just finish what I wanted to say then. That's, yes. That is the question. <laughs> that is the um, question. 
Yeah, you know, I, I actually spoke to, so my alma mater reached out to me about a month ago uh, with a situation at the school. Uh, there, there was a half Asian uh, student there who was struggling, who was struggling with um, how her teachers were handling her. Um, and uh, she didn't feel like she comfortable to talk to anybody. So uh, the head of the school reached out to me and said, Pearl, would you be willing to meet with her on Zoom? I said, absolutely. So we talked for about an hour. And um, my advice is uh, be adventurous. Don't, uh, don't try to fit yourself into a mold, yeah? Do what speaks to you and what excites you and what um, inspires you. And don't allow anybody to tell you that you can't do something because that is going to be the biggest boundary is when people tell you you can't um, and then you and you believe them. If you believe them, then then, then you're done. So um, and 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 have conversations with your professors. They're people. They're your teachers, but they're learning from you, too. So they uh, a lot of these professors are, you know, have a lot to learn and how to teach people of color if they are not people of color themselves. So, you know, if they're assigning you things that are traditionally from a show that uh, is meant for what you look like and it doesn't speak to you and it's not something that you're interested in doing, go speak to your professors and say, hey, can I talk to you? I would, I'm really interested in this role in this show. Can I work on that material? Is that okay with you? Can we, can we have a conversation about that? You are a collaborator in your career and how you want to move forward. You you drive you drive the car. All right. Thanks. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Pearl. Anybody else have anything to share with this young woman? Listen to Pearl. Always listen to Pearl. Listen to Pearl. <laughs> you know, and like trust yourself. I think that's very hard when you're young and especially in an industry like ours when so much of it depends on like the approval of somebody else, right? But I think you have to know who you are, what you're good at, what you want to sing, what you want to say. I agree. It's sort of like if the part, if you're getting, you know, offered parts that do not speak to you, you don't have to take them. You can look for the you can look for the things and work on the things that you want to, and you have to have a very strong sense of yourself to survive in this industry anyway. So you might as well start practicing. You know, I I really truly believe that. You know, I, you know, as everybody knows, it took me a very long time <laughs> to like, you know, get parts to like work consistently a very very long time, but I always sort of knew in the back of my head that I could do it. And I should do it, and that I had to keep going, even if there wasn't a whole lot of encouragement at very many places in the game. You know, sooner or later, your truth will out. You know, I just had to stick around for a really long time for that to happen, and hopefully, it won't take that long for you. But you have to know, you have to, in, you have to know inside who you are and what you want to say, and that's really it. And I, so keep going. Yeah. And I just have to I just have to echo in there. I um your agent, Dale Davis at the time, who I just adored. Um, I remember calling her one afternoon. It was right after Avenue Q got green lighted. And I said, You sound happy. And she said, Oh, darling, the same day two of our clients who have been working for free on these readings and developments <laughs> of the show both got green lighted, and you're gonna be so happy. Our Ann Harada is moving forward with a new project called Avenue Q. And I was like, <laughs> Yes, I was so <laughs> excited because, of course, I brought you in for Susical. So Dale and I, Dale knew I adored you, and and it just kind of took off from there. So I know just what you're talking about. Yeah, I know you too. <laughs> <laughs> I be I bear witness for you, ladies. I I watched you grow, Pearl. I remember your showcase at Cap Twenty One. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been around a while, so it's uh, it's just you know part of it is the growth of just watching women become, you know. Laney, my my dancer in Vossi, to more juice, um, you know, to becoming a writer, director, creator of new works, and uh, 
you know, uh, Diane, you're you're now uh, you say you don't feel a part of this Broadway Broadway royalty, but you're you're running. What was it? Unapology, unapologetically Asian, and also racism is a virus are two of your organizations. Um, and Ali, of course, from from understudying Dee Dee in Aladdin to you know Christine on Broadway. You, you're all just phenomenal women, and um, I I you know. Part of the reason I wanted to host this tonight is because I can bear witness to that. You know, I've watched you over decades uh, create the the dazzling comet uh, through the sky that you are, and I know you're just beginning. So all of you are just, you know, you're on your trajectory, and there's way more to do. And I know you'll do it. I I, I trust it in your hands. You know, um, I didn't mean to say that as a closer. Did anybody else want to give advice to my student? <laughs> I'll throw in one thing for your student. All right, um, I will say just to remember that when you're breaking barriers, that you have to be twice as good as everybody else to do it. And so kind of just embrace that idea that you're gonna have to work twice as hard and not to be mad about it, just kind of love it that, you know, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you wanna be twice as good? And then you just embrace that and like Ann says, if you can envision it, you can do it. I feel like that has the one thing that has been proven to me in this world over and over. And yeah, it can take a really long time, <laughs> a really long time. And, um, but God, if you can see it for yourself, but if you can't see it, then no one else can. So that's all I'm gonna say. Thank you. Um, I might just throw in to, you know, A, it is completely okay to feel all the feelings you're feeling at this time. Obviously, we all are too. It's, you know, you you are completely valid in, um, in being overwhelmed and maybe not needing to take a break from creating. And that is completely and always acceptable to honor your feelings that way. And then, you know, just that, like, we have your back. You know, I think that's being in the company of this amazing group of women, like that's, that's what's great about being part of this community. Is that, you, know, you might not know you personally, but we are, we are rooting you on and we are um, invested in your success. So you're not, you're not alone. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not worried about this next generation coming up. I'm, I'm now a teacher now as well. And the people that I'm seeing that, especially this Gen Z, they are special. They are just they are just a whole new breed of people and that they really, really are gonna change this world. So um, you know, trust trust those, trust those, trust everything that's in you because you you have everything in you to change this world and the world is gonna change with your generation. I'm 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 hopeful. And on that beautiful note of hope. I, I just, I don't have the words to thank you all for um, your very open sharing and for being present with us tonight and for sharing uh, your thoughts and experiences with the world. I, I respect, honor, and treasure your voices and you as human beings. Um, Pearl, I don't know if I went on to say what it was like sitting in that room watching a showcase of kids when this statuesque, phenomenal woman came to the center of the stage and that voice and all of us, every casting director and agent in the room was like, who, who is that? Who is, where, where'd she come from? Um, but I've had a similar moment with every one of you. And uh, you know, to come all the way here tonight and, and talk to you is such a joy because you know, I asked at the beginning, what, what do people see when they, they look at the five of you? Do they see women? Do they see Asians? Do they see Americans? Do they see theater artists? Do they see Broadway? The, the little theater geek inside my heart has been geeking out for the past hour and 10 minutes. I just, I just adore all of you. I'm so crazy about your talent. I get so excited to see you come into a room um, and to see what you've done in auditions over the years and what you've done on stage. And it's just such a, such a part of making me who I am that I have just been in so happy and, and will continue to be. So thank you all for being a part of this brilliant conversation. And I will just say to everyone listening again, 
We support the Actors Fund. We support Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. We all benefit from it. It is the way our community has been helped through this pandemic and the way we continue to be helped. And so anything you can do to support those organizations, uh, uh, again, every artist here donates their time in the hope that you will pay it forward. Um, and that is one way to do that. The other way is to allow this brilliant conversation to sit on your mind and to remember these things as you go forward into the days of your life ahead. Uh, and I guess that's it for tonight. So again, and thank, I you, thank Arnold. you all so much. Really thank you, pleasure. Arnold. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Lindsay, can you take us out? Because I don't.